Okay, right, I will begin. So um, as Annie said, my talk today, um, naturalism as world-oriented, Midgley as a supplement to foot. Um, I'll explain all the terminology that's going on here, but broadly I'm going to be looking at the naturalisms of Mary Midgley and Philippa Foot. Um, and, um, sorry, just getting my notes in line here. Okay, so Mary Midgley and Philippa Foot are lifelong friends and colleagues, um, and I'm going to be looking at their naturalisms, um, comparing and contrasting them. Um, so just a broad overview for those unfamiliar, naturalism broadly construed is a realist position, so it claims that there are objective, mind-independent moral facts, which are grounded in some way in natural facts about living creatures. So context of my PhD. So I'm just going to set a bit of background here for where this paper is coming in. So hopefully this will contribute to my overall aim of my thesis, which is broadly a historical and a contemporary revival of Mary Midgley's naturalism. So Mary Midgley as a philosopher um, has been very widely neglected within academic philosophy. She's been picked up in other areas, but um, within moral philosophy, she's been severely overlooked. Um, so I'm looking to revive her naturalism specifically. Uh, and my main tool for doing this in my thesis is to try and chart the links between Mary Midgley and Philippa Foote um, for various reasons, which hopefully will become clear. Um, so I'm trying to use Foote's naturalism as sort of a battering round to show how Midgley's, well, Midgley's naturalism is relevant because Philippa Foote's naturalism is picked up broadly across moral philosophy. So I'm trying to use her to push Midgley into the debate. So. For those unfamiliar with these women, um, they were undergraduates together at Oxford during World War II. They both pursued long careers in philosophy before their fairly recent deaths. Um, and my interest in the relationship between these two women is part of a larger borrowing interest in the quartet of female philosophers. Uh, this quartet um, is being researched and theorized by the In Parentheses Project, as I put up here on the screen. Um, and this, uh, this In Parentheses Project broadly theorizes that Iris Murdoch, Mary Midgley, Philippa Foote, and Elizabeth Anscombe make up a philosophical school of thought. Um, just a note of warning before I continue to give you an overview of my talk. This is um, a work in progress, so part of my thesis, there are still moving parts. Um, I'm still about halfway through my PhD now, so still sort of parts being worked out, but looking forward to getting everyone's um, thoughts on that. So just a quick overview of my thought of my uh, talk today. Um, in understanding these theories of naturalism, I'm going to draw primarily on Mary Midgley's very first book she publishes in 1978 and Philippa Foote's final book, Natural Goodness, which she publishes in 2001. So 23 years difference between the two texts. Um, both are very rich and they try and position human beings within the rest of nature. Um, just an interesting historical note about the two women. Midgley references Foote's uh, work throughout her book, Beast and Man. Um, and she writes a review about natural goodness when it's published. But as far as I'm aware, Foot never um, reads Beast and Man. She certainly never references Midgley. Um, Iris Murdoch, a friend of both of them at Oxford, try and get Foot interested in Midgley's work. She sends her a letter um, to say, oh, look at this great book. But um, I don't think Foot reads it. Although I have my suspicions because natural goodness has very similar strands as hopefully will become clear um, to Beast and Man. So, the naturalisms of Foote and Midgley have some remarkable similarities. Um, these aren't to be, these aren't yet explored or understood. Um, so that's broadly the work of my thesis. But today I want to draw out an interesting difference between the two philosophers, um, which I will expose by a famous criticism of Foote by um, a man called Scott Woodcock. According to Woodcock, um, Foote ultimately undermines exactly what it is that makes her naturalism unique namely a continued continuity between moral goodness and natural normativity. I will go on to explain what that means. So my argument in this paper is places Midgley's flavor of naturalism, which I've coined world oriented. Um, again, I will explain that, but I'm proposing this naturalism as a solution um, to the problem that Woodcock raises. So a broad overview of my talk. Oh. Um, I'm gonna run you through an argument over the next half hour. I will explain Mid Foot's naturalism first for those unfamiliar. Um, another word of warning, this is the most complicated section of the talk. So if you can get through the first 10 minutes, then it's plain sailing from there on. Um, second section is the continuity objection, which I've coined that phrase for Woodcock. Um, but of the various criticisms, I've picked this one because I think it reveals the best difference between um, Midgley and Foot, which I'm sort of trying to draw out. Um, so I'm going to consider John Hacker Wright's defence in light of the initial worries that Woodcock considers, but ultimately the continuity problem um, 
is revisited, so it continues through um, John Hackerwright's attempt to defend it. Um, in the final section, I'm going to use some interesting concepts of Mary Midgley's naturalism, which will hopefully be helpful in replying to some of Woodcock's worries. So without further ado, this is the next section. Philippa Foote's naturalism. Um, I'm just going to present the, the concepts that I rely on for my criticism, because Foote's naturalism is very um, complicated and rich. So the natural goodness is quite short, really, if anybody fancies it. Um, so this is natural goodness here. The central claim Foote's trying to establish in natural goodness is that moral goodness is an aspect of what makes um, is an aspect of what makes us good as human beings. In other words, being good and practicing the virtues will help us to flourish as human beings. To establish this conclusion, Foote defends a form of um, evaluation based on goodness and defect in living things such as plants and animals. So according to this approach, there are objective features of living things that make them good as members of their species. So there are objective features of deer, um, that depend on what it is to live a good life as a deer, such as having four legs. There are good things in the life of a plant which make it good. Um, for example, having deep roots is one of Foote's examples. And the norms that de determine what makes something good as a member of its kind, she calls natural norms. So John Hacker Wright, um, who is um, the broad interpreter, he has quite a lot of books published on um, Philippa Foote. He says that she has two central premises, which I'm gonna run through in the next two slides just to give us a better idea. So the first premise is, um, grasping something as an organism requires us to situate the organism against the background of its species. And the second premise is, to situate the organism against the background of its species requires us to consider it from a normative perspective. So I'm just gonna go through these once in turn to give a bit more clarity. Premise one, grasping something as an organism requires us to situate it within, against the background of its species. So she's drawing heavily on her student, Michael Thompson, in creating this premise. Um, basically, it's to claim, when we claim that an individual organism is living, Foot claims we are situating it within a wider context of its kind. Um, this is a life form in Foot's terminology. Life forms determine the background of norms according to which a creature of, of a question lives. So for example, Foote uses this example, um, a wolf hunts in a pack, um, oak trees have deep roots. These are judgments that we make about species which create and um, mesh together into this broader picture of a life form. Um, it's a life form description is what makes gives sense and understanding to the lives and the processes of individual animals of that species or creatures of that species. It is against this life form description that certain activities make sense, such as eating, growing, walking, and thinking. So um, descriptions of this kind wouldn't make sense if we applied them to say a rock or something that wasn't living. So basically this naturalism is really set up on um, the lives of living creatures. Um, so notably there is um, natural variation within species, um, most of which is not essential in order for us for a creature to function as one of its kind. So by this, I'm gonna give one of Foote's examples just to explain what I mean by this. A blue tit can lack a patch on its head and still be a blue tit without being hindered in living its life. So the blue um, patch on a blue tit's head isn't essential for it to be described as a blue tit or for it to flourish. So on Foote's account, there are certain operations that are fixed, things that play a vital part in the life of the species. These are what she calls teleologically related to the good of the species. So they operate, they function within a broader picture. So to add in a bit more terminology, if I've still got you at this point, Foot claims that judgments about the vital operations of a given species are called Aristotelian categorical. So they're categorical within the life of the species that, for example, the wolf needs to hunt in the pack in order to flourish as a kind of being that it is. A lion must have four legs in order to flourish as the kind of being that it is. It's teleologically important. So human, the human good is constituted, um, sorry, the human good is constituted by the human life form, and this comprises of things that we ordinarily think of as necessary for a good life. So um, like nourishment and shelter, enjoyment, contentment, having personal relationships and friends, huge variety of things that categorize the human life. Um, so while she acknowledges this variety, she thinks that there are some things that run across the board, and it's in relation to these things that we are judged. And this leads us on to premise two. Premise two. Premise two says, 
To situate the organism against the background of its species requires us to situate it, from, sorry, to consider it from a normative perspective. So um, straight in with an example here, um, because, so for example, because deer escape from predators by running, a certain degree of swiftness is required to be, sorry, this is a quote from Foot. Um, because deer escape from predators by running, a certain degree of swiftness is required for a deer to be good qua deer. Against these standards, we can make normative assessments of individuals in question. So there is an instance of a natural defect um, when individuals don't live up to these Aristotelian categoricals of their kind. So the deer that has three legs is not living up to the broader picture of the, the good deer as Foot sees it. Um, in doing this, Foot is recognizing organisms as functionally organized. So these vital operations, so these Aristotelian categoricals that each being needs in order to operate as a good being of its kind, um, they function within this broader picture of the life form of the species. So given this, Aristotelian categoricals have an interesting form. Um, they are logical concepts rather than empirical ones. So take the example, tigers have four legs. Um, this is on the screen. Um, so this is not a contingent fact on the development of a present set of living tigers. Um, so a disease could have killed or could have, could, have killed, could have removed a leg from every tiger on earth. This wouldn't prove false the Aristotelian categorical that tigers have four legs, nor is it a hypothesis about past tigers. So the generality expressed by this Aristotelian categorical is neither universal nor statistical. So from the fact that tigers have four legs, it doesn't follow that a particular tiger has four legs or even that any tiger right now has four legs. And additionally, this is not determined by counting all the tigers and taking an average of the number of amount of legs that they have. Okay, so this is the interesting part um, when she transitions to human beings. So this is a unique and interesting move in Foot's naturalism is her application of the first two premises to the human life form. So she says, the evaluation of goodness for humans are of the same form as evaluations of goodness for other living things, such as wolves, peacocks, and oak trees. So, uh, quote here on the board. The concept of a good human life plays the same part in determining goodness of human characteristics and operations that the concept of flourishing plays in the determination of goodness in plants and non-human animals. So the characteristics that reflect goodness in human beings are obviously very different from those that reflect the goodness in a peacock or an oak tree, but the claim here is that the form of evaluation remains the same. So again, a quote on the board, there is no change in the meaning of good between the word as it appears in good roots and as it appears in good dispositions of the will. Okay, um, so for foot, the lives of non-human animals are exhausted by what she calls a life cycle. That is um, development, self-sustenance and reproduction. So all of the operations that happen in the lives of non-human animals function according to these life cycles. Um, and that, so it completely exhausts their lives. So all the actions that my dog does is, um, a, they only do them in accordance with these sort of three things, development, self-sustenance and reproduction. Um, crucial to the human good is the ability to recognize and respond to reasons for action. So this ability is precisely um, the application of reason on our actions. This is why we're interested in ethical evaluation, right? Because we're able to sit back and think, oh, was that the correct thing to do? Uh, and this, and that's responding if, to reasons for actions, reflecting on my reasons for actions, that's the reason we're ethical beings. So moral evaluation of human beings are specially connected to voluntary actions and thus do not correspond to any equivalent, equivalent um, evaluations of goodness in plants and non-human animals. So um, voluntary actions are what categorize our life form. That's what's different between us and non-human animals. Um, the quote here, um, she says, to speak of a good person is to speak of an individual not in respect of his body or the faculties such as sight and memory, but in concerns of his rational will. So the excellent exercise of practical reason is something upon which the good hangs, to use some Anscomian terminology, um, in, a, in a human life form. Um, natural goodness, she says, in reason following is as much a form of goodness in humans as its proper instinctive behavior in animals. So just this final section, just as nearsightedness counts as a defect in human beings because of the function of sight in human beings, injustice counts as a moral defect in human beings because of the function of cooperation. So propositions such as humans are cooperative, humans are compassionate, 
um, count as genuine Aristotelian categoricals about the human species of the foot. Okay, it's all the boring stuff out of the way, hopefully. This is the middle section of my talk, which is the continuity objection. So this is an objection to the position that I've just um, outlined. So in order to establish her naturalism, foot relies on an uncontroversial continuity between the conceptual structure of human moral evaluations and evaluations of natural goodness and defect among all living things. That's what I've just said, established before, but there's a continuity between one and two on the on board. In arguing this, Foote must avoid suggesting that individual humans that do not physically live up to the natural norms set before us by our species. So for example, an individual who is lesser abled, an individual who is blind, we need to make sure on Foote's theory that they aren't deemed morally defective on Foote's account. Um, her solution to this, which I have also outlined, is to argue that evaluations of good humans are specifically moral claims about the rational will, and they don't have anything to do with a physical defect um, under Foote's theory. But, and here comes in crit the criticism, or the initial, the initial problem that um, Woodcock points out, in pressing a continuity between natural goodness and moral evaluation, Foote raises the question of why, in her theory, it is not the case that a person is morally defective if he or she chooses not to have children, refuses to cure an existing disability, or decides to go ahead with a pregnancy when it is known that resulting child will be born with a disability. So because she's pressing this continuity between biology and rationality in order to set up her naturalism, she needs to account for why people who choose to seemingly go against what she calls the natural norms of our species, why that decision isn't um, an, a defective decision in her view. So in other words, she must account for the moral status of people who are rationally, rationally choose actions that seem to go against natural norms. Um, okay, so John Hacker writes, says that this isn't a problem and he can solve this. And this is his uh, defense of, Foots, of um, Woodcock's initial worry. Um, so he is defending the non-empirical nature of Foote's ethical naturalism, he's sort of like re-stressing it. And he says that the facts at the foundation of Foote's theory are natural because they reflect normative judgments about the needs of living organisms in the natural world. And yet they are not meant to be empirical explanatory descriptions of the type we receive from say evolution biology and other sciences. So the facts that anchor Foote's ethics are based on a distinctive logical form that is presupposed whenever we describe something as a living organism. So she doesn't need to account for the moral status of actions of, of the person who rationally decides not to have children because it seems rational choices aren't tethered to the biological life cycles of human beings in the same way that they are for non-human animals. These judgments identify each species vital functions and according to Foote, the capacity for rationality overwhelmingly characterizes the human life cycle. So the standard of goodness for our species shouldn't be based on anything apart from exercising virtues um, of practical rationality. Um, okay, so the continuity problem, however, for Woodcock claims still um, rears its head. He claims that this move seems to cut the cord to considerations that are related to the human life cycle which will undermine the continuity that is supposed to make Foote's appeal to natural normativity unique. So she's setting up her naturalism by starting off with these biological life cycles of non-human animals. But then when it comes to humans, she seems to be cutting the cord to this consideration. Um, and what makes her account of practical reason unique is the way that this content is determined by natural facts about living things. Um, and if, as is the case with John Hacker Wright's interpretation of Foote, the Aristotelian categoricals that specify this content are entirely distinct from empirical details about the human species. This sort of brings into question how Foote's established in her Aristotelian categoricals in the first place, if they're neither empirical nor tethered to the life cycle of a human being. It's not clear how we can ascertain whether we are looking at accurate claims about facts, and it's also not clear where the continuity that she's promised us arises. So as um, Woodcock says here in his 2016 paper, instead, the details of the human life cycle seem to play a secondary, if not dispensable role to John Hacker to, in, in Hackerite's account of how practical reason determines the content of virtues. But it is not clear how the normative status of virtues is clearly being derived from natural facts as was promised. So this is actually a plausible view and it's one that John Hacker writes, um, he would come back to Woodcock and say, that's fine. Um, but it's properly described as a Kantian variant um, or some variant of Kantianism, um, rather than a form of neo-Aristotelianism, 
which foot wants in order to ground natural facts in our species. So it's not what foot would want, even if it is what John Hathaway White would want. Okay, this is the more exciting part of my talk. Now getting on to Mary Midgley. Um, here we go. Part three, Mary Midgley's world-oriented flavor of naturalism. Um, just a side note, I've put flavor because I'm still trying to work out exactly what, what her claims are. Like she's, she's quite implicit in the way that she writes. So I'm drawing out explicit philosophical theories from her work. I'm not entirely sure whether she'd be happy with me doing that, but we're gonna do it. Um, so just a few preliminary, preliminary points. Um, I will only explain the parts of Midgley's naturalism here that are relevant to Woodcock's worries, um, but I'd like to note this is no way exhaustive of her theory of naturalism, but hopefully I'm trying to start to suggest that her naturalism is rich and relevant to modern discussions of ethical naturalism, um, because it's so far been underappreciated. Um, I can hopefully show that she'll solve some problems that Foot faces, um, and how, she, so um, yeah, I'm gonna first in this section consider how she sets up her naturalism so that it doesn't run into Woodcock's continuity worries. And this will hopefully provide us with a satisfactory response to the moral status of actions, which are rationally chosen that go against the natural norms that are presumed for our type of living. And um, for example, choosing not to have a child. Um, okay, so a shared school of naturalism as is on the screen here. Um, the naturalisms of Mitchley and Foote come together in some really interesting ways, most of which I have no time to discuss now. But importantly for my um, discussion, both women seek an Aristotelian elucidation of naturalism, which positions human beings within the rest of the natural world. Um, like Foote, Midgley attempts to create a naturalistic structure, which is objective, provides an objective basis for goodness, badness and defect within living creatures. And both women take influence from Elizabeth Anscombe's paper, Modern Moral Philosophy, in which she claims our good is bound up with the traits and circumstances creatures like us need in order to flourish in characteristically human life, as I said on the screen here. So my claim, um, Mitchley will maintain that the content of practical rationality determined by natural facts well, sorry, Mitchley will maintain the content of practical rationality determined by natural facts about living things without cutting the cord to considerations about the biological lives of human beings um, or other living beings for that matter. The Mitchellian notion which I'm proposing to solve the continuity problem faces is Mitchley's notion of integration, which I'm gonna go on to explain. And this is quite unique to her naturalism, I think, um, something which I'm just trying to draw out in my PhD at the moment. So, this is uh, Beast and Man. This is like an early cover version of her. She's, she's got a bit less of a scary one now, but I quite like the first one. Um, Michelin naturalism, unlike Foot, Michelin has a constitutive notion of human and animal nature. Human nature is a cauldron of needs and wants that form into a cluster. She writes in Beast and Man, as I've written here, the nature of a species then consists in a certain range of powers and tendencies inherited and forming a fairly firm characteristic pattern, though the conditions after birth can vary quite a lot. So we have innate tendencies such as the need for shelter, um, the desire to be loved and wanted, the tendon, and, and each of these tendencies, these broad tendencies as Mitchley construes them, um, have what she calls a natural stint and bound. So there's many different ways for me to instantiate my desire to be loved or my desire to be um, sheltered. Like I can live in my flat here or I can live in a tent. The, the different ways of instantiating my, my broad innate tendency to want to be sheltered. Unlike Foote's account, um, characteristics of species are empirically observed from Midgley and they're not functionally derived. So they're gathered by biologists, ethologists, anthropologists um, to form an empirically informed picture of a species and the individuals that belong to that species. So rather than being intrinsically normative, human nature and animal nature are made up of wants and needs from which normativity is derived. So human and animal nature is an empirical concept and it's contingent on our evolutionary history. And it's also a dynamic one for Midgley, so she's able to claim that human nature and animal nature is changing. Um, she's highly impressed by Darwinian evolutionary theory and she claims that the welter of wants and needs and instincts provided to us by our evolutionary ancestors, and some of which we share with our um, neighbors, our other animals, are relevant to our values. Um, the Midgelian notion which I'm proposing to solve the continuity problem, getting back to the argument, um, is that of integration, which is an empirically observed capacity, which is endowed to us from our evolutionary ancestors, and it's necessary, Midgelian claims, to live a good life as the kind of creatures that we are. So what is this integration we keep talking about? Integration. 
Unique to Michelin naturalism is the empirical observation that we are the kinds of beings that have a natural need to integrate ourselves, integrate our personality. So be a continuous person with um, a continuous narrative. I am the kind of person that doesn't lie to my friends, etc. Two, the naturalistic claim that, at least in some part, the prescriptive force of our wants and needs comes from this natural demand to integrate our being. So we have, Mitchley writes, a deep need for unity, which is luckily to be found at our centre. People have a natural wish and capacity to integrate themselves, a natural horror of being totally fragmented, which makes possible a constant series of bargains and sacrifices that shape our lives. According to Midgley, we naturally experience struggles between competing needs and wants. So for example, um, shall I spend my evening with my housemates or shall I spend the evening um, writing my thesis? Um, shall I go for a run or shall I stay in and make myself pancakes? All sorts of um, seemingly trivial but also um, important decisions that we make on a daily basis. Um, the moments of conflict between these two, between needs and wants, expose struggles of priority. And we are called every day to specify and prioritise which actions will best serve us as a whole. We seek a balance. And our moral sense is tuned to this balance. So for humans, it matters to us in the moral sense that we are integrated. It matters that our personalities are balanced and one element doesn't become superior to the rest. And she has an interesting book called Wickedness, where she talks about when sort of one... Um, one area becomes dominant over the other so like I become very very greedy that that we would say as I'll just go on to say now that would be immoral and that's when one area my personality becomes overpowering and on the level of experience this rings true it's difficult to reconcile goodness and inadequacy when they are present in the same person um so in this sense, Mary Midgley retains um, a footy and sense of immorality as a defect. So we tend to think of an immoral act as something that emerges from a fragmented individual. Um, so we can't ex understand how a serial killer kills somebody because it's so far out of our personality, or our, our notion, our narrative of our normal human life. Integration, again, that's slide on integration. So how does this help solve the problem of continuity? Notably, the Midgelian notion of integration spans across life forms. It's not unique to human beings. Um, so challenges of internal conflict happen across the species barrier, meaning other animals also negotiate needs, though to a lesser extent than humans. So in Beast and Man, Midgley uses the example of wolves, um, who she claims act on purportive patterns provided to them by their lasting character traits, um, expressing priorities. So. They will prioritize proper care of young rather than neglect or brutal treatment of them. And this is a good thing in the life of a wolf. Um, Mitchley writes, as I've quoted here on the board, when these things happen, it is not just unfortunate. So she's talking about when, for example, a wolf um, neglects their cub. When these things happen, it is not just unfortunate, it is out of character. They are doing something wrong, something disproportionate to their nature as a whole. So, at the same time, look, this second quote um, explains how integration is also, um, or prioritization also happens in the lives of wolves. So powerful general motives, such as um, proper care for young, can easily make them delay immediate gratification of desires like hunger or sleepiness. So although clearly it's not to the same extent as human beings, there's some notion of integration going on across the species barrier. So as such, there is a logical analogy between humans and non-human animals, sorry, as such, rather than a logical analogy between humans and non-human animals, as is the case with foot. For Midgley, there is an explicit empirical comparison to be made between species. Midgley does not cut the cord to those innate tendencies provided to us by our life cycle. Rather, these provide the basis, although the broad basis, for our everyday moral re reflections. Um, so on Midgley's account, that this is a whole other section, we are related and, and we have close propensities and feelings with other animals. We have overlapping tendencies. We care for our young, they care for our young. And this is a real thing that we share instincts, um, overlapping instincts. Another interesting part of Midgley's philosophy, which I can't go into now. Okay, next section, practical rationality. Practical rationality in human beings emerges as a structural property uh, to help us negotiate the numerable and complex nature of human wants and needs. Um, Mitchell has this example in Beast and Man, which I should have put up here, but to, um, to do with beavers. And she, she talks about how they have like um, engineering capacities. And this is a, like a structural thing that they, they have, which helps them to live in like sort of the best life that they have. 
Um, and it, it's sort of an analogy here with the um, human capacity for rational, practical rationality. We have all these conflicting wants and desires and because of the kind of beings that we are, we have innumerable of these, like there's so many. Um, and practical rationality helps us to decide which one to which one will help us to best integrate our life. Um, but it not only helps us to negotiate um, these needs, it also intensifies internal conflicts by allowing us to reflect on our choices. So I've done something that I feel I shouldn't have done. Um, so I lie to my sister about something and then I feel bad about it later on and I, I reflect that that wasn't something that I'm the kind of person that lies. Um, so I feel bad about it and that's where the moral comes in. Moral argument is therefore an attempt, a rational attempt, to sort out our priorities and our needs and our wants. Okay, another interesting part here. Um, humans and non-human animals. Since it's the need and the want that it's prescriptive on us, um, she draws no prima facie differentia between humans and non-human animals. So she is explicitly resisting attempts to sever, sever the link between humans and non-human animals. She insists, as I say on the screen, we are not just rather like animals, we are animals. She begins her book, Beast and Man, by saying this. So all of her, the rest of her philosophy sort of falls out of this premise. We must, which she argues, this is quite an Aristotelian point, drop the simple differential scheme and leave any questions of distinctness from other species right out of the argument. Admitting a continuity with our evolutionary ancestors and neighbors is an important part of material naturalism, central part, I would say. We share many of our natural propensities for kinship, cooperation, and loyalty with other members of the animal kingdom. And as such, some of our human goodness can lie in the activities we have in common with the animal kingdom, such as eating and procreation. Mitchley would reject Foote's contention that all non-human creatures can be placed into a homogenous category of animal and labeled with the same life cycles um, of reproduction and growth. Um, so when she's saying that human non Foote's saying non-human life is exhausted by these things, Mitchley would just reject that claim. Um, she would say that foot doesn't capture the life form of non-human animals at all. And by reducing them to these life cycles, she overlooks the complex, diverse nature of non-human life. Um, and it is in this sense that I want to describe her naturalism as world-oriented. I'm still trying to the hash out. But basically, this is the notion that goodness spans across life forms. And it, it, she doesn't tolerate any arbitrary boundaries. Um, she wants to sort of say that the, the natural world and all humans and animals within it um, can fall within our theory of naturalism very harmoniously, and not just through logical analogy, but through um, real um, cross species. Um, so I'm just gonna come back to my argument here. Um, diverse life forms. So I'm, again, this is a way that she's replying to the initial worry that I came up with um, of Woodcox. So on face value, Mitchley's theory doesn't appear to solve the problem of disabled individuals, right? If anything, it seems to tighten the grip of this criticism by increasing the importance and the dictates of our biological natures upon us. But Mitchley's naturalism actually has some clear answers to this, I think. Um, and so it's not the case that disabled individuals or those choosing not to have children are in some way um, defective morally defective um so by dropping a view of living beings as functionally organized Midgley's account admits a complex and multifaceted variety of possible life forms and there is therefore an innumerable way innumerable ways of organizing ourselves according to the good she writes as i put here human needs are multiple we have many sorts of good because we have many sorts of want so though the features and capacities we inherit in our biological nature provide the limits, as I said earlier, the stint and the bound of our needs and wants, for Midgley, there is a rich variety of different ways in which we can fill these needs. Um, so without Foote's function argument, Midgley can drop the notion of a vital operation, which creates the standard upon which the individuals are judged. And instead, rational choices are those that integrate the person the best. And this is a fact about our biology, something that we share with non-human animals. As I've detailed, the connection between a human life cycle and the rational will enters at, at, as in the form of a natural demand, which is provided to us by our nature um, in order to integrate our conflicting wants, desires, instincts into a consistent whole. Um, further, the good life of any individual is determined not by which elements of the cluster you happen to have, but how, by how consistently you integrate yourself, which for humans will involve rationality. 
dropping the claims that individuals ought to live up to some broader picture of their life form delimits foot strict account of what it is to live a good life as the kind of creature that you are. So there's much more room for individuality, I feel, in this account. As such, rationality remains within the realm of the biological, such as it was in Putt's view, but we can worry less about the exclusion of less than perfect people because of the flexibility that Midgley takes to be in the biological goals of humans. Last slide before a conclusion. Um, there is a communitarian strand, which it can also help us to reply to Woodcock's worries. She stresses the social interpersonal nature of mammals and humans in particular. And in this way, her approach to animal natures is an important sense communitarian. The lives of individuals rely on communities and social groups for their success. And no individual can exist without the community. So um, a quote from Mitchell here, a stronger and more considered sense of the good is the good that is wanted by him as a whole on grounds conveyable to those around him. So we must be able to communicate with those around us the moral good. This provides the setting within which vulnerable members of the community, so young people, old people, disabled individuals, and indeed those who are caring for them have a natural place within the normal functioning of human life and society. And as has become all too aware during this pandemic, we naturally rely on one another and fulfilling these, nodes, these roles in society for Midgley um, is necessary um, and indeed in order for society to flourish not everybody needs to have a child so it's quite straightforward sort of view okay um, my conclusion according to Woodcock Foot's naturalism seems to use human biology to elucidate nationality without really tethering it to our biological nature in the end Midgley's naturalism does not rely on cutting this cord to the human life cycle. She retains a clear continuity, leaving her with a robust claim to naturalism. So she retains this setting for ethics and she retains an Aristotelian biological underpinning. And the strength of her biological notion of integration um, is that it's part of the human and non-human life and it includes an essentially social aspect. So she's able to maintain flexibility within life forms and individuality within life forms. Um, just a few questions which I still have to answer. Maybe this would be a good Q&A. Um, how integrated, so this is maybe some points that Midgley needs to answer. How integrated do we need to be? What is the authority of this need to integrate? And how determinate is that need in the kinds of demands that are issues for us in terms of how we live? Um, Midgley isn't very clear on these points. So again, I'm trying to draw these out of her um, work at the moment. Um, and that's it. Here's some sources and contacts.